Good morning, sisters. That's pretty good, actually. I don't have to repeat myself. I'm Lois Pace, as Michelle said, from the Global Health Council. I'm based out in Washington, DC. Welcome to the farm, for those of you who haven't been here before, and I'll tell you what that means if you don't know. <laughs> but as Michelle said, we're, um, we're getting into the fun, fun, a more fun portion of our program in that we get to hear from women like us, but women who are doing amazing work for other women all around the world in incredible ways. And the best part is they're just getting started. You know, They have a long ways to go in their careers and we'll get to benefit from their great wisdom and value in the years to come. So I'm excited to be moderating this portion. You will not see or hear a lot from me. I'm really here to just keep time, honestly, and crack the whip a little bit, which I think we're good at as women as well. Uh, but I will say that one of the things I'm really happy about is to hear from these champions, these heroines, because in the work that we do at Global Health Council, speaking truth to power in Washington, D.C., in Geneva, and beyond, we really rely on the stories from these women who are in the field doing this work tirelessly every day. And it's the proof that I need to really convince people, policymakers, and the general public that Global Health truly works. Another reason I'm really happy to be here is a couple years ago, a lot of you know, the Women Leaders in Global Health Initiative was actually launched at GHG's Landscape Symposium. And so it's just really been an honor and privilege to have been a part of that. And I take zero credit for it. I give all kudos to those of you who were behind the launch of that movement, especially women in global health. I know Rupa and her team are here and they're all volunteers. And it also, yeah, let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> And very biasly, my family at the Leland Stanford Junior University, my proud alma mater. So with that, let's get into it. I will first invite Nicole Bates up to the stage. And just as she's coming up, I'll explain that each of these speakers will have two minutes to make her pitch with regards to her work in global health and how it benefits women around the world. Thanks, Nicole. So good morning, everyone. I'm going to tell you a quick story. Um, about six weeks into my master's program, in public health, I found myself on my advisor's couch. I had just returned from an outing for a class project where we were tasked with designing a programmatic intervention for a local community in need. And I was troubled, maybe short of distraught, but I was definitely troubled because I could not reconcile the assignment to design a behavioral intervention for a community whose fate was clearly dictated by broader political, social, and economic factors. My very wise advisor sent me off to take a health law class where I found my niche on the political side of health. A few years later, I went on to earn a, uh, earn a doctorate in health policy and leadership, where I studied the dynamics of political networks. So you see, it ends up that my unique contribution in health is to help create the political environment that makes possible those programs where individuals, families, and communities can thrive. Over the past 15 years, this has meant facilitating cross-sector partnerships to establish shared platforms and political agendas around malaria and neglected tropical diseases. It has meant uh, advocating for domestic and international policies and financing on vaccines. It has also meant seeding a community of civil society actors who both generate demand among the public, but also commitments and accountability among policymakers and leaders. Most recently, for me, this has meant helping to guide a highly decentralized global organization through the change process um, to increase its impact on building political and public support for the causes of children. You see, for me, what I've learned is that in the global health space, it is actually the space where the different sectors and functions come together, either, uh, either organically or by design, where innovation and solutions, like ending preventable child deaths or eradic eradicating polio, are found. This is why gender and diversity in all of its forms matters. There's no single solution to, there, there's no single model for the solutions that we seek as a community. Women think differently than men, that is a fact, yet our leadership should not be seen as an exception or something warranting adjustment. It is only one of the many models that helps us to achieve our shared goals. I am Nicole Bates. I am a female leader in global health. I see the world as a, as a, as a network, a complex network, and my superpower, if you will, is connecting the dots. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Nicole, for kicking us off. And next, we have Mega Agarwal. I'll share six lessons from my life. One, 
Don't be afraid to be the first one. 14 years ago, a remote engineering college in India for the first time floated biomedical engineering as the subject without having much of its infrastructure in place. And I'm so glad to join the first one, as the first one on this bandwagon, having my share of faults and mistakes because of my pure passion for biomedical engineering. And incidentally, I was ranked first in the university. <laughs> Second, play with science. So three of my inventions happened just because I was playing with science and having fun with it both in home and at the lab. One of them was a heart hole closure device for a newborn babies and the design was inspired by a badminton shuttle. <laughs> Third, own your mistakes and the faults. So back in University of Cambridge while doing my PhD, uh, my research was facing many setbacks and failures. But in the midst of all of this, I stumbled upon designing a low cost glucose monitoring system using ultrasound. Number four, multidisciplinary is the future. In Stanford India Biodesign Program, we developed a trademark device for accessing the vein of people. And I was so glad and I learned so much from the designers and doctors in my team. Five, empathize. So think back while you're thinking ahead. As a STEM ambassador uh, with my work with underprivileged girls in, in India, I realized that one of the most important things to really inspire and truly motivate uh, young girls for science is to first understand and address their fears and inner feelings. And number six, uh, share your stories, even the most personal ones. You give strengths to others and also defeat in the face of the most ingrained stigmas in the society. October is the month of sharing and creating awareness about pregnancy losses, and here I am talking about a few of them through this year. And a bonus tip is to just ask. I've learned and gained a lot by doing that, and I would encourage all of you to come and just ask me for more. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mega. Next up, we have Amma Finney. Amma, please join us on the stage. Thank you for having me. My name is Amma Finney. I'm a lecturer, I'm a researcher from the University of Ghana. I'm also a mother of two wonderful daughters. I'm a wife of one husband. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that as an economist behind the national statistics, a huge, tremendous um, contributions by women which are never accounted for. I know also that when we want to do gender analysis, we just stop at disaggregating the data between just males and females. But then beyond that, and beyond these binary statistics, are huge and deep issues that affect women. And so I highlight three different areas that we need to look at. The first one is to have many more men in this room, so that by next year we'll have 200 men instead of 20 men, yes. And because we need men to engage with women so that we can fight against these traditions and cultural norms and social norms that are challenging all the breakthroughs we are making in science and medicine. I also want to highlight the fact that our women leaders now have the space to make more for the younger ones who are coming for the Angela Michaels and the Tamares from Ghana, from, for favorites from Rwanda. We need to create the space for these young women so they're in leadership roles way before their 30s, unlike us in our 40s and 50s. We need to make that happen for them. Finally, it's about sacrificing. Our world is full of sacrifices and we need to dig in and make a difference where it really counts. Thank you. Thank you, Amma. Next, we have Krista Donaldson. My first memorable experience, okay, you can hear me, um, at a hospital, which I know all of us are very tied to, uh, was in the summer of 1998, and that was when Al-Qaeda attacked the U.S. Embassy in Nairobi. And I was working as an engineer, it was my first real job, um, and like many people, stunned and shocked, went to the hospital to give blood. And my most vivid memory from going to the hospital was seeing other women who were also dressed for work and realizing that the pattern on their dresses were not floral. It was actually blood splattered. And the, t the, the memory I had was the, the healthcare workers working diligently and trying to console and try and treat the injured. And many of you know, because you were there, over 5,000 were injured. 
I've been in many hospitals since then, and it's a theme I've seen in a pattern over and over again, hardworking, diligent doctors, hardworking, diligent nurses, government officials, and trying to provide the best care they can in a system that's not always working. One of the missing pieces that I've seen, and again, keep in mind I'm an engineer, is I see broken equipment. I see homemade equipment. I see equipment that's shoved in a corner because donors have donated 20 pieces of the same equipment to a hospital that only needs like four, and then the hospital down the road doesn't have any. Um, and I've seen incredible doctors designing things. like I. The call for innovators, we hear you. Um, so I now lead an organization called DREV, it's short for Design Revolution. We're a nonprofit medical device company. We have two lines of products. Um, they're now in 50 countries. We actually sell them through the market. Most of our buyers don't even know a nonprofit's behind it. And the health issues we work on are those that disproportionately affect the poor. The one thing I would say as a woman, and this is going back to leadership, is that I believe we are such good listeners and to do the work, particularly the technologists and all of us, we have to listen to our users. We have to serve them and part of that is listening. And I don't think we see enough of that in global health and all of our work. So one last thing I'll say, call to action, two things you can do, join boards, nonprofit boards, corporate boards, Go into leadership, we need you. And then the second thing, the donors in the room, I would love to see you publish your list on gender, just the way Dr. Gray has done in South Africa. Thank you. Thanks, Krista. Annette, Annette Moyo. Good morning. My name is Annette Moyo. I'm a postgraduate year two doctor and future surgeon from Zimbabwe. Um, about 30% of the global burden of disease can be attributed to surgically treated co treatable conditions, making it a key result area in global health. To achieve universal access to safe and affordable surgical care, Zimbabwe needs to more than double its surgical workforce by 2030. This cannot be done while excluding 50% of the population. Currently making up only 7% of an already inadequate surgical workforce, Zimbabwean women need to lean in and participate more meaningfully in surgery. So through our surgery interest group called DREAM for a purpose, um, we have created a platform for information sharing and mentorship for women medical students uh, going through training in Zimbabwe. We believe this can serve as a pipeline for the development of women in surgery. We need visible women role models, like Professor Harriet from Makerere University, who spoke here earlier, who are going to be key in achieving this goal. Making decisions and saying, look, I'm the chair, she can go on maternity leave and come back and continue like nothing happened. Moreover, we need a culture that challenges the hidden curriculum at medical schools and the unconscious bias against women in surgery. So the engagement of male attendings and colleagues is also critical to get to a place where they can accommodate women in the male-dominated corridors. So we advocate for a deliberate policy shift towards training more women in surgery. As research has proven, and you saw the paper today, that women actually do make better surgeons than men. Thank you. Excellent. And Sarah, Sarah Minsky. Thank you, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here um, as part of this inaugural conference. My name is Sarah Rominski. For the past decade, I have been working in the field of global health at the University of Michigan, initially as research staff, and more recently as faculty in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. All of the work that I have done has focused on women. Um, and for the most part, that has been also delivered by women, um, as far as nurses and midwives. While women are the primary recipients and the givers of this care, um, I, I don't see women in the roles of decision makers or leaders. The ministries of health are staffed by men. The hospital leadership committees are staffed by men. Um, all, all of the aid organizations are headed by men. While women's health is deemed important by these people, um, it is not given the same resources as many of the other factors of affecting uh, global health. Um, 
I believe that um, inevitably women's health issues are not, do not receive the priority they deserve. I discovered early in my doctoral work around barriers to safe abortion care that when determining reasons for unsafe abortion, researchers and policymakers never simply asked women why they chose the path to care that they did. We as health planners and policymakers expend countless energy modeling why women choose and how we can incentivize women to choose contraceptive care without asking women what they want in contraceptive care. The care that women, is, that, that women give to women is still largely dictated by men, studied by men, and deemed beneficial or not by men. If we are here to improve the lives and the health of women, women need to be empowered to, to advocate for our own health care. We need to talk to the end users of care to determine what is quality as those women determine it. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Next we have Joya Cecira. First of all, I think I'm the tallest, so I will just adjust this. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. My name is Joya Sasira. I come from Uganda. I'm a lawyer, so I feel so out of my depth right now, but I will rise to the challenge. Um, I also have a master's in public health leadership, and um, my story is a bit different because it all started in a law firm. After uh, law school, I went to do my bar course to be enrolled to the bar, and um, I had to do an internship at a huge law firm, one of the biggest in, in Kampala. And what I realized from the files that I was analyzing was that it was always a big company against uh, a lowly old woman or you know, a widow. Either it was about land or this person had been laid, laid, off, laid off from work because um, you know, they had to take days off to attend to a sick relative. And this really started, got me thinking, am I in the business of selling justice? And what happens to those who cannot afford the price of a good lawyer? They don't get justice. So I walked away from the law firm and headed into first research. I worked for a consultancy firm where we're doing uh, research on development issues, social economic issues. But then I also still felt like I wasn't serving anyone in particular. I was serving everyone and no one. So then I headed into an organization called the Center for Health, Human Rights, and Development, where I started focusing specifically on reprodu sexual and reproductive health. I focused on sexual reproductive health because whereas God had given us this gift as women to be able to have this unique function to reproduce, in my country it is a curse. It is a curse because 360, over 360 women die from preventable maternal um, mortality causes. And of these, um, four to five out of 16 who die daily are due to unsafe abortion. So I took on a very controversial role in my country where I am the national coordinator of a coalition to stop maternal mortality due to unsafe abortion. In this role, I have found that all the global health issues that we're talking about, access to medicines in the context of sexual reproductive health are a challenge. And this directly affects women because first of all, they are the ones mostly living below the poverty line. They cannot afford health care. And so when it comes to negative sexual reproductive health outcomes, they are the best, they are the worst, you know, affected. So this got me thinking when I saw the call for the application for this conference, am I a leader? And the answer was yes, because it starts with me. What have I done? I have been a mentor. I have mentored young girls and young women and held their hands and helped them realize that they can do anything they want. Look at me. Should I have be, would I have been here if I hadn't uh, taken the chance or the opportunity to apply? I wouldn't, because I am a lawyer. What do I know about global health? I will admit I've never sat in any class to study global health, even though I have studied public health. And then the other thing that I wanted to say is do not be afraid to be controversial. I have been controversial. In my country, everyone looks at me and says, don't you have you know, better things to do with your time? And I say, what is better than standing up for the women and girls who cannot speak for themselves in the one aspects that makes them the bedrock of this country, their ability to give life, their ability to create the next generation. And I believe from that, that I will be able to lead many, many more women by mentoring, by being, um, providing opportunities, but also challenging laws and policies that negatively affect women. Thank you, Joy. And finally, we have Jess Mack. I would love for everyone to please close your eyes for a moment and take a deep breath and visualize just one person that has truly believed in you, 
someone that rooted for you, someone that gave you a chance, someone that gave you really, really helpful advice, helped you out in a hard moment, even when they didn't need to. Visualize that person. And think about how it felt to know that they were rooting for you. How did that feel? Did it make you want to root for yourself even more? Now open your eyes and look around this room at all of these stunning, incredible people and know that every single person here has been invested in and has been believed in and know that every single one of us has the power and the responsibility to give that to somebody else. There's a lot of power and privilege in this room and it feels damn good <laughs> and we have to use it. So I want you to also think about who's not here. Think about a young woman who's not in this room for whatever reason. Over the next year, I want to challenge you to a couple of things. Mentor at least one young woman, at least, preferably multiple, but at least one young woman. Ask her what success is for her. Meet her there and help her figure out her next steps. Be generous with your time and with your resources. Challenge yourself to say yes, even when you might have said no. Ask for a plus one. Pull up a chair next to yourself. Help her get there. And when you do that, talk about it. Talk about that to other people. Tell them what you're doing and why, and encourage them to do the same. Because when we invest in young women, when we root for women, when we pull up more chairs to the table, that is when everything starts to change. That is when the conversation gets richer. That is when our impact gets that much greater. That is when the table gets a lot bigger. And that is how we are going to transform the global health leadership landscape. Thank you. Thank you, Jess, and thank you, everyone. I love this round of applause for all of our emerging leaders. I think they did a great job. <laughs> I have one more question. Are you feeling inspired? Great, me too. The good news is that we'll have more of this this afternoon, so stick around and feel free to network with each of our leaders over the lunch hour. Thanks again.